Hey everybody, welcome back to the Everything is a Primary Source podcast. I gotta tell you, it's good to be back. I hope you've enjoyed the holidays and that 2023 has started off as good, no, better than expected. Things here at Everything is a Primary Source headquarters have been going swimmingly the last few weeks as I haven't slowed down with collecting pop culture artifacts to be used to learn about history. Season 2 picks back up with a short that was recorded back in October of last year at Defiant Records and Craft Beer in Laconia, New Hampshire. What a perfect spot for a night of podcast karaoke. Not only did I bring a slew of pop culture selections for taproom guests to choose from, but directly in front of me were stacks upon stacks of vinyl to browse and buy. My first on-the-spot guest that night was Bob. And he gravitated towards the copy of Bob Dylan's Highway 61 Revisited that I brought. So Bob on Bob, a take on Dylan's 1966 follow-up album Blonde on Blonde, is an alternate title to this episode. Anyway, the Bob who podcasted with me had his fingers on the pulse of the Everything is a Primary Source podcast. He knew exactly what I was up to. Just like the Bob who recorded the album in the mid-1960s understood the heartbeat of the youth in his era. Our conversation moved along like a rolling stone so well that I decided to make it two parts. Take a listen to part one, and if you want to hear the second part early, become a patron at patreon.com. All right. Hey, Bob, are you ready to go? (laughs) And yeah, you go ahead and take that seat, and you know how that microphone works because you have one at home, and (laughs) the closer the better. So you have selected a Bob Dylan record. Yes. And uh, what exactly was it about Highway 61 Revisited that caught your eye tonight? Uh, Well, first off, I'm a huge Dylan fan, so it's kind of a no-brainer a little bit. It's my favorite personal uh, Dylan album, but also one of the most popular ones he's ever put out. And uh, in the context of history, a very important uh, album in rock and roll. History. Yeah, it, you know, it's it's early, you know, early Dylan. You know, people always you know think about the different ages and stages of Bob Dylan. And, Absolutely. Um, yet the the title. I mean, so it's I guess early rock and roll, early folk. The title is very deep. It, you know, mm-hmm. it, 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 it does, it's not clear exactly what it is. It's not like, let's go surfing or you know, right, something right, right, like right. that. It, it's very... And that was what rock and roll was up until that point right. in the early 60s, the Beach Boys. And the Beatles were just kind of starting out, so they were the teeny bopper band. And so rock didn't have any of that gravitas or whatever. That yeah. You would later see probably in excess with the 70s prog rock, but... <laughs> right. You know. and, and even the album cover... Is uh, it looks like he's backstage and just somebody snapped a, yep. a candid photo of him that yep. he's not, you know, posing for anything. He doesn't have, you know, to go back to the Beach Boys comparison. He doesn't have a surfboard under his arm nope. and you know standing at, and, and nothing. I love the Beach Boys and they yeah, went on to do some pretty incredible uh, out there things. But um, so the question that I decided that we should talk about is what was the maker's role or status in society <sighs> and uh you were just saying that bob dylan um which i if i'm not mistaken i think bob dylan has a direct connection to the the day that the music died with buddy holly and um Big i Bob think he, he was there <laughs> that night the last concert of that that winter oh, wow, okay. tour that uh, i didn't know but yes b- before he changed his name to bob dylan <laughs> I, I think he was he was in attendance to that and oh, wow, okay um, yes I, I could be wrong about that, but, you know, he was, the, in other words, on the front lines of early rock and roll. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, with this album in particular, of course, um, Dylan's role in history, I think, is up until that point was the f- folk movement right. of the 60s. So Joan Baez and, and people like that. And he was at the forefront of that, right? So everyone kind of, and of course, the Vietnam War was just mm. kind of really starting to take over. And we were really about to dump a lot of effort into that. Uh, and so, of course, the, the, the folk was kind of representative of the, I think, the counterculture at that yeah. time and stuff. So he was like the voice of the generation, right? He was the kind of guy that the youth of America was looking at. Um, 
when they wanted something deeper than I want to hold your hand yeah. or that kind of stuff, which was uh, permeating um, popular radio or music at the time. So, so he was really almost like a bridge artist between, because I think a lot of times people, and we're here in, in like a hall of rock and roll yes. at Defiant Records. <laughs> it's It's like... You know, we, we picture rock and roll always being renegade music and being the, uh, you know, kind of pushing the boundaries and being the rebel music and all that. But it wasn't really that way early on. No, I mean, not at all. I mean, I guess maybe for the times Buddy Holly looked weird or something well, and, I would and made say louder music, but... I would say Little, Little Richard probably yeah, was he, the guy was like, that was scaring yeah. people. You know? <laughs> and, but maybe you know, for different reasons that we would consider it scary today. But at that time, he certainly was like nothing anyone right. had seen before. And, but, and the, the, the things he was singing about was just, you know, really, you know, the same thing that all songs are written about yeah. up until that point. So Love. nothing really, yeah. you know, like when we look at uh, some of the, the si song listings off of Bob Dylan's Highway 61 Revisited, uh, like a Rolling Stone, yep. Tombstone Blues. <laughs> uh, it takes a lot to laugh. It takes a train to cry. Yes. From a Buick Six Ballad of Thin Man, Queen Jane, approximately. That I mean, that's not a, a an album, a, a song title that you hear. It doesn't roll off the know. tongue. <laughs> right. It, it's um, you know, he's definitely a Brit. And then here's um, you know photographs of him playing the piano and setting up his electric guitar and and all that stuff. So you know, the folk artists were really. They were the renegades. They were yeah. the out there. They were ones. the counterculture. They were the, it, it, it outgrew from the beatniks of the 50s, and that was the kind of natural extension from there. Um, but yeah, they, they were looking to Dylan, you know? Yeah. And uh, of course, this was his first album that he really was kind of full in on the electric side of things, which of course to the folk uh, fans at the time was considered a major betrayal. Right. You know, because he was supposed to be, the, you know, the, again, the voice of this generation. I don't know if it, I think it was Graham Nash... I think I, I heard him say one time he was quoted to say rock and roll is fo folk music because mm -hmm. it's music of the people it's yeah. untrained yeah you know I always get a little bit kind of weirded out when I hear things about like school of rock not the movie necessarily but like you know yeah. where they where kids the go concept. and train to be yeah and they, they learn you know reading sheet music and I'm like no rock and roll doesn't <laughs> come from and folk music doesn't come from sheet music right which, incidentally, in front of you, I have a Duran Duran sheet music from the 80s, That's if awesome. anybody else is interested in looking at that one. <laughs> but it doesn't come from there. It comes yeah. from here, the heart, you know, it comes from your mind. And, of course, the blues, too. Yeah. It, Same kind of deal. It, it's right? poetry. Yeah, it's, and absolutely. It's, you know, for lack of a better term, it's almost like street music in a way. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's lived experience, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's that co coming through in so the rock and roll, for sure. You've seen Dylan a couple times, you said? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. um, would you say that... You know, more recently, did you did you see him long ago or no, fairly well, recently? No, the, the first time I saw him was uh, 1995, and then I saw him again uh, probably 2008 ish something like that so a little bit of a span in between there so not like a you know a different kind of probably other people you know that grew up with Bob Dylan and, and understand him to be you know what he is iconic yeah. yes. and <laughs> whereas here he was still building his status yeah right and it was only in the folk music side of things uh, when he went electric that opened him up to uh, a whole new audience obviously but also again rock and music we uh, yeah the, the surf in USA that kind yeah. of stuff he really lent that you know these heavy lyrics that meant something other than just I want to hold your hand right. or that the typical teenage stuff you were getting before so he kind of bridges that and, and gives legitimacy I think to, to rock at that time it, it, and it says something that. about the maturing of the audience too yeah. because they were growing you know, up with this exactly right? yeah. they, they were it wasn't like rock and roll music was just for people ages 12 to 14 <laughs> you know <laughs> it was originally yeah, and then right. they grew up with it and so yeah. rock and roll matured with it um, yeah. you know you, you were saying that one of the times you saw Bob Dylan was with Willie Nelson yes and <laughs> him he's one of the highway men right he, uh, you know, yes, with, yes one of and them. so I always you know years ago and I, I have to say this it was before Walk the Line came out yes uh, because that created a whole new generation <laughs> of Johnny Cash fans but, yes absolutely 
I, I, it was like a few years before that, a friend of mine turned me on to Johnny Cash. <laughs> and um, it didn't take long before I realized and found out just how much Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan worked together. Yeah. That they were, uh, they collaborated a lot. They borrowed each other's songs a lot. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, definitely. And Cash really saw him as the voice of the youth. Yep. You know, I, I don't know the age differential between the two, but I think it was at least a, a couple of years. Uh, yeah, Cash easy. was older. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, you know, that seemed to be helping along the status because by that time Johnny Cash had established himself yeah and had you know he was on the opening crest of rock and roll artists that then went more the country direction yeah. and added I, would you say that would add legitimacy to Dylan yeah d absolutely I mean um, Johnny Cash was doing things at that time that no one else was doing uh, and I bring up like uh, Folsom Prison you know, yeah. or Live at San Quentin right, right? he goes in there to play for criminals, like people right. in jail, which was a forgotten popular population in this country, probably even still to this day, yeah. but but certainly back then, and to- A captive audience, I hate to say Captive audience, <laughs> right, you know, I'm a musician Literally. also, and yes, captive audience, absolutely, but, um, but yeah, I think that, you know, it, it, to have someone like Johnny Cash, see those see that population and, and, and be an advocate for them right I think uh, is what he has in common with with, with Bob Dylan you're right and I, I you know I think of uh, Bob Dylan's work with uh, the hurricane that song yes another and, one yes. you know and he wrote that for yep. uh, the name Ruben Carter that's right Ruben <laughs> Carter um, so you know he was in prison and yep. uh, I think about Bob Dylan at the March on Washington yeah that him and Joan Baez yep. and I, I I think one other folk artist were present and they and it, I, I remember showing that one time to my class hi <laughs> Just the wife over. Oh, excellent. The wife is just going to say, I love I, the song, The Hurricane by Bob Dylan, because it really accentuated that time period when he was doing what he needed to do as far as giving a message to the people. And, and it's it's absolutely a message song, isn't it? Yeah, it Because is. it's not a three-minute long verse, no, chorus, verse, no, chorus. No. It's like eight minutes of yes. a no. story. It was a story. It was it, you know, it was someone's life, and he he he, he documented it well. And I'm Carol. By the way. <laughs> and you're up next, by the way. <laughs> there no, you I'm go. not. <laughs> I, I I think about because I remember seeing that movie in the theater, and it it says a lot about Bob Dylan's place. Yeah. That they of all the things they you know that I'm sure the song helped prompt the movie being made in the first place. Oh, yeah, I would. I and would then say, the yeah. title. Yep. You know, that yep. it wasn't just, yep. you know, so his... That's the power of music to... And again, we go back to the uh, the theme, which is like, yes, the maturation of rock and roll, yeah. where it's, it's it, it has meaning for people now. They're, they're not afraid to tackle these topics that are not easy to tackle. That's absolutely true. Yeah, and, and it's it's almost gone to the point now where it's not even just rock and roll that does it. Um, you know, lots of different, you know, just rap music, music in general. Rap music comes to mind, yeah. like, immediately. And, you know... Uh, is but do you, I, I'm assuming he is, but is Bob Dylan in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Yeah, I, he was probably early class. He may have been that. one of the first ones. Yeah, yeah. like the, <laughs> even before they had the museum set up. It was yes, just like, absolutely. And you know, the the hard thing to do about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, unlike you know, like a basketball Hall of Fame or any of the sports Hall of Fames, where it's like, did you make this many wins? Did you, you know, did how many points? It's very subjective. It, it is very subjective, <laughs> and yet um, I think it probably has a lot to do with how much of a difference he made in the music. And the same thing goes, I think like Run DMC is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. And when they got inducted, people were like, but they're a rap group. Yeah. And it's like, no, it's not the actual sound of the music, which they did use a lot of rock sounds in their music, but yeah. it's not the sound, it's the attitude, it's yeah. what you did. Yep. And so, I mean, over time, it's gonna essentially be the Pop Music Hall of Fame. Yeah, I think that's right. I think you're right. There's like Run DMC and Donna Summers in there and stuff. and. That's, those aren't names that leap to your mind when you say you know, rock and right. roll. But they also had, you know, especially Run DMC, that kind of, again, counterculture kind of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, with, and they had something to say. And they're all early rap music, too. Yeah. And, and that's what's funny is that, like, I remember, um, like, 
you know, punk rock is like my favorite kind of music. Yeah. And, and that's, and the Ramones being, you know, arguably the founders of that kind of sound. Yeah. But they were middle class kids from Queens. They weren't, yeah. you know, from the city streets. They, whereas, arguably, the, the London scene was much more the gritty. Yeah. And so, um, I, I think it was Johnny Rotten once said that he's like, you know, punk in America isn't necessarily that CBGB crowd. It's the hip hop from, you know, it's mm-hmm. street music. It's yeah, street urban music. music. It's yeah. not meant to be, you know, and it might not sound exactly the same. Um, you know, of course, a lot of that stuff crosses over each other. Yep. You know, the Beastie Boys came yeah, from Beastie that Boys, great hardcore example. scene, but then they yeah. went on to becoming rappers and yep. stuff. Um, back to Dylan, though. Oh, you're going to have to wait to get back to Bob Dylan. But not very long. The rest of our conversation will be ready to go next Tuesday. But you're welcome to listen early, either by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash epspodcast or subscribing to the newsletter at epspodcast.substack.com. I hope you've enjoyed listening to what you've heard so far. Please join us next time for the EPS Podcast, where everything is a primary source.